It's thinking. We are live. Excellent. Oh, extra buttons. Thank you, Zoom. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. We are so excited to have everybody join us this evening, along with one of our favorites, <laughs> Mr. Kelly Grayson, uh, along with Doc Clinchy, our president. So uh, thank you so much for spending Friday with us, Kelly. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Don't get too carried away. We want to keep it zeroed into EMS if you can. Awesome. Awesome. We'll, we'll try. No guarantee. We'll, we'll do the best okay, we okay. can. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Kelly. If anybody well, has any questions, drop them in Facebook and we'll try and get to them later. Cool. Kelly, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for giving us your time this evening. It's, um, it's awesome, Doc. My, my uh, honor to be here. Um, what I want to do is go back. First of all, I'm really fascinated by what you told me your fiance is doing. Mm -hmm. Let's getting started telling me what telling me about god i can't even talk i sound like joe biden um tell me about this concept of redesigning volunteer ems well nancy's uh nancy has a bit of a contrarian view on uh the the state of volunteer ems in this country and and what needs to be done to fix it uh you, you find every pundit uh pundit or or uh subject matter expert who's writing about is writing the same things. Um, and they've been writing the same things for 20 years, yet we still have volunteer EMS and volunteer EMS is still dying. This is the longest death scene uh, of, of anything in the history of cinema for certain. But um, she uh, approach, approaches volunteer EMS from a business person standpoint. She was a successful businesswoman for, for years before she got into volunteer EMS. Uh, and then became a, a manager at a uh, EMS, volunteer EMS staffing firm uh, in Connecticut. And uh, she saw so many people doing things wrong. And, and her, the essence of, of what she, she espouses is that, that EMS has evolved, but volunteer EMS has not. And the, their staffing models, the way they try to recruit people, the way they try to pay for themselves, the way they try to justify their, their value to the community is is a model they've been trying and struggling with since the 70s but it doesn't work anymore that the workforce has changed so dramatically that, that if you're going to keep doing the same old thing you're going to keep having the same old uh results uh and and people keep saying this you know and and one of the things she, she points out is is uh it's one of her lectures she calls it a uh, freaks geeks and soccer moms uh, that we, uh, in general, in EMS, tend to recruit the wrong kind of people. Uh, we, we, we strenuously recruit the, the adrenaline junkies uh, instead of trying to teach a, a caregiver to func function under pressure. We try to take an uh, adrenaline junkie and teach them how to hold hands and that that's often more important. And the same is true of, of volunteer EMS. She said, what are you doing? You're out there trying to recruit these, these new EMTs and youngsters. And who in the world most needs to earn a paycheck than a new EMT? <laughs> she said, what you do is find people who have reached that, that, that tier on Maslow's hierarchy, that their, their focus is turning outward. They're, they're empowering their communities now. They're empty nesters with, with uh, the, the urge to give something back to their communities. She said, go out there and get those healthy 50 and 60 year old people uh, and, and get their wealth of knowledge capital from the real world and, and teach them that, yes, indeed, you can be an EMT and you can give back to your community and we, we sorely need you. And, and she, she has a lot of contrarian views and man, she has worn me down over the years <laughs> and has pretty much uh, reversed my, my conventional wisdom that I shared with just about everybody else in EMS. So, well, it's, it's, good. it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I was really intrigued by that because uh, where I started before, after my mm -hmm. fire service career, uh, but where I started in EMS, we were volunteer. And then we ended up on pay per call mm -hmm. and the unit is gone. And I was chief of that squad and it's gone. I mean, it yeah. has just vanished um, because it became part of a countywide paid system. And they basically wiped out squad 142. Um, yeah. So it's intriguing to see what happened. And all those people dedicated a large part of their lives to serving their community. Mm -hmm. And they sort of got 
tossed aside, and that's very sad. Well, you know, people have been saying for 20 years that, that volunteer EMS is in decline, and it has been declining for 20 years. Um, can you think of anything that happened 20 years ago that really, really changed America? <laughs> uh, there, this thing called uh, the September 11th attacks. Yeah. You no, know? and and yeah. volunteerism soared. You know, we were uh, people were people. You know, vicious political foes came together. You know, yeah. people that from all walks of life learned. You know, figured out that they were American first, and whatever yeah. hyphenate afterwards. Uh, and, and they started giving back to their communities and, and it was a horrible thing to happen to our country, but, but it really, uh, swelled the volunteer ranks and, and what's, what's been happening in the last 20 years is not that a decline of volunteer EMS and it's not a decline that, that people just don't have that, that community spirit, uh, that they once had before 2001, what it what it's doing is, is reverting back to the norm, uh, yeah. and, and what it was before that seminal event. Yeah. And she's over here writing me notes, but uh, uh -oh. she said the never forget people forgot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me go back now. Early Cali Grayson EMS involvement, Farmerville, Louisiana. Tell me how you got started. Tell me why you got started. Number one. And then well, I was, uh, I was born the son of a poor sharecropper and, and uh, he turned me out at an early age and I had to earn a living. No, I was a, uh, a failed retriever trainer. Um, I, I had become a, uh, I took over business from my brother when I uh, graduated high school and I went to college and, and uh, dropped out of college after a couple of, uh, couple of years and had nothing to do with my life. And I, I was training retrievers and for hunting and field trials. And uh, the I got burnt out on that. Uh, the reasons why I will we'll delve into later, but uh, I, I woke up one morning and looked at the face I saw in the mirror and didn't like who I was um, because I was uh, doing a disservice to my clients and, and leading them on because of my, frankly, depression. And uh, I said, you got to do something different. So I went to the local technical college and was intending to enroll in a practical nursing course. I had student loans to pay off, so I was going to have to pay for this out of pocket. And uh, so I, my intention was to sign up for this practical nursing course. And they said, well, we've got an 18 month waiting list for that. But we have this thing called emergency medical technician that people sign up for and a bunch of people like it. So I said, well, I'll give that a whirl. And about, uh, about three weeks in, I decided, okay, yeah, this is, this is going to be me. This is going to be my career. So I, uh, I became a nationally registered EMT on March 19th of 1993, I believe it was. And uh, uh, funny story is that you, you told us earlier about the, your, your uh, golden retriever was, was the, the talk of the, or the, the pet of the firehouse. Well, my dog got me my first job. I showed up uh, at the brand new mom and pop startup ambulance service in a coat and tie with my Corona beach club t-shirt under my, my dress shirt when I'm afraid to take my jacket off. Cause you could see the, you could see the Corona logo through my shirt. And, uh, my, my prospective employers chatted me up and put me through a very skillful interview that didn't seem like a job interview at all, but they coached my life history out of me. And at one point I said, well, I, if y'all excuse me for just a minute, I've got to go out to my truck and, and let my dog out, let her exercise a little bit. He said, well, bring her in here. So I brought Sprite in and uh, they discovered that I had a, a three-year-old uh, hunting retriever champion Labrador retriever that minded better than their kids. And I was hired. <laughs> you know? And for the next two years, uh, Sprite and I lived in one of our ambulance stations uh, while they got their billing straightened out. I worked for free, but Hey, I didn't have to pay rent. They fed me. Uh, my dog got to stay with me. Uh, and I was 25 years old and loving every minute of it. So yeah, that's, cool. that's how I got started. Cool. Very cool. Well, um, I'll talk to you some other time about retrievers and field trials and hunt tests, but anyway, um, yeah, we have some common background. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yes, uh, so from Farmersville, then Farmersville, you went from, from there to where? Uh, we were, we were a, a small 
mom and pop company. And one of the problems with uh, one of the things we were we were encountering uh, at that company was, uh, you know, small mom and pop and you're struggling to make it. You're wondering how you're going to pay for your next box of four by fours, much less make payroll. Um, and we were being frozen out of the local uh, EMT and paramedic classes. And uh, we fought long and hard. We said, if we're going to have EMTs, we're going to have to grow our own. So they sent me to EMT instructor school uh, after I'd been an EMT for about five months. Uh, I had a whopping five months of experience and went to EMT instructor school. And, and when I did, uh, I was issued a stack of three ring binders about four feet tall. And then one of them was a small blue bound textbook uh, for EMT instructors uh, by a guy named Dick Clinchy. Um, and, uh, I, I held on to that thing for 20 years, got it signed by you at one point. And, uh, I, I went on to paramedic school and, uh, I got my paramedic certification one year to the day after I got my EMT certification, I, I went through an accelerated course. I was Louisiana's first zero to hero. Uh, they had to waive their, their regulations at the time that required one year of experience on an ALS ambulance before they'd let you enter paramedic school. And uh, I was the first one to, to do that. And, uh, you know, I was a little young, immature, uh, not the best, uh, didn't have the best reactions to authority. And uh, my boss and I had a falling out. Um, I put my heart and soul into, into uh, the ambulance service and, and bought into the we're a family atmosphere. But, but uh, you know, if a family member calls his parents idiots long enough, they'll fire him. They'll, they'll excommunicate from the family. And uh, so when that happened, I, uh, I fled to South Louisiana, worked for a service down there for a little while and, and met a girl, uh, as many of us do. Uh, she was an ER nurse. Uh, we fell in love and got married. And um, about an 18 months later, my old partner uh, was killed in an ambulance crash. And we, we went back to, uh, to the funeral and my boss and I uh, buried the hatchet and he asked me to come back as education director and a, and a shift supervisor. So I went back up there and I, I did, I kind of did part-time teaching and full-time uh, uh, field paramedic and, and, and uh, supervising. And uh, I struck upon the secret for career longevity for me, at least. I work in ambulance until I start to hate patients. And then I work a classroom until I start to hate my students. <laughs> and then I go back and forth. And it generally works about five years either, either way. So lately in, the, uh, lately in the last 10 years or so, it's been about equal measure uh, students and, and patients. And uh, Nancy keeps me healed in so I don't hate anybody. But uh, that's how I've done it over the years. What? So you've been doing this now uh, almost 30 years. Yep. Right at 30. What's your impression of the direction EMS is going right now? Um, I think technically we are, we are growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, the, the things that I am teaching and the depth that I am teaching people in, in EMT class even is far, far beyond what I had. We learned I, I memorized my EMT textbook, my paramedic textbook by rote. We had protocols. It was heavily dogmatic and you, you memorize rules. You know, I can still calculate a dopamine dose in my head, uh, let alone the fact that dopamine isn't all that good a drug and we shouldn't be using it that much anyway. Um, but Hey, I've got all this arcane knowledge and, and yeah. rules and maxims in my head. And it took me probably 10 years to know that the, the most important, uh, the most valuable, uh, um, the most valuable thing you can learn is that the answer most often is it depends. Uh, and there's a lot of nuance to our craft. And, and that's, that's the kind of thing that, that empowers critical thinking. And, and I became uh, less of a skills wizard uh, who, who looked at my patients as uh, merely a, a high, the next high fidelity skills mannequin to prove what a stellar paramedic I was into something more of a thinking paramedic and realizing that uh, the, the emotional aspect and, and the service aspect of emergency medical services was probably the more important thing. And uh, that's, that happened, it, it happened after my first DWPA call. I'd been a paramedic for about a year and I killed my first patient. 
and um, uh, it was a really, really bad call. And I was cocky and unprepared because I was cocky. And my patient died as a result. And uh, after that call, I went back to the station, uh, locked myself in the bathroom and cried, cried myself to sleep in the shower. And when I got up the next morning, I, it was gut check time. Uh, you can either uh, do whatever is necessary for your skills and your knowledge to catch up with your ego, or you can decide that uh, perhaps it's time to seek a rewarding career in the fast food service industry. <laughs> so I decided to be a better paramedic and, uh, and, and pay attention to, to uh, perhaps what I didn't at first appreciate were more important things. So that's You're what right. I've been doing since. You used an acronym that some people may not know what it means. DWPA that's died with paramedic assistance. Um, that's right. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I've been doing medical legal expert witness work for 32 years, and I see those on a pretty regular basis. Yeah. Uh, but I know from what you just said, one of the things you are probably teaching your students now is a lot of physiology. And a, a lot, lot of understanding what the hell is going on. Mm -hmm. um, it, it astounds me to talk to some youngsters who are in EMS and have a license. And they really don't understand what's going on with the patients they're dealing no. with. Because no. they're doing cookbook paramedicine. Uh, and it, it still survives even to this day. And I, and I, I yep. do not know how. Yep. And one of the other things that I like to share with youngsters um, in our business, because you and I have been in a lot of places where patients have died. Mm -hmm. And I said, sometimes the most important thing you might do for that patient and their family is to hold their hand as That's they right. pass on. The, the simple gift of being there. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So Farmerville, South Louisiana, now you're back up. Somewhere in Louisiana. Central, right Central Louisiana. Exactly and, and, yeah, a little town called called Pitkin, uh, home of some of the finest locally sourced, uh, artisanally crafted methamphetamine money can buy. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's but it's ever that could be said of virtually any small town in the south. Oh now. my god! But, uh, yeah, I work. Uh, I work full time as a paramedic uh, for Acadian Ambulance uh, as a critical oh. care paramedic and. Uh, my other full-time job is, is teaching and consulting and, and trying to pay it forward a little bit and, there you, go. and uh, you know, trying to, to create a, a better EMT, a more prepared EMT who is uh, capable of, of uh, critical thinking than I was when I started. And I have and a that's tremendous been, amount of respect. Right I have a yeah. huge amount of respect for your employer, Acadian. They, they do it well, like any, yes, like any, do. yeah, like any private for-profit entity, there are, there are elements of, of, uh, what we do that, that, you know, you, you got to make a buck, you, you got to turn a profit. Uh, if you don't, you're not going to help anybody and you're going to go under, but of all of the, the employers I've encountered that, you know, uh, the, the private EMS employers I've encountered, uh, to my mind, they do it the best. They do the best job of, uh, of balancing uh, patient care and and advocacy with the need to be profitable, uh, yeah. and and I think they do it well. Sometimes you know a little bit gets lost in the wayside, but but they are they were light years different uh, or or uh, 180 degrees different than what I perceived them to be when I started and what they perceived me to be uh, yeah. when I went to work for Acadian 13 years ago. Uh, there was some, I knew most of their senior leadership in, in my area that I applied to. Uh, and there was some, I was told there was some serious discussion that uh, maybe they shouldn't hire me because at that point I had a, a fairly big platform in blogging and, and podcasting and speaking around the country. I was a fairly well-known person and uh, they just didn't know if I could, could fit in to the Acadian way. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I jokingly call them the Borg because they slowly inexorably uh, assimilate smaller EMS services in their creep, in their creep, <laughs> creeping out. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. But uh, I haven't been fully assimilated, but it's been a, it's been a good journey. These guys have, have treated me well. And uh, I don't feel I've never been one of those people that, that is uh, prone to, uh, 
waffle on what needs to be done or ask for permission. Uh, I've been more the type to beg for forgiveness and ask for permission. And uh, the times that I've had to beg for, for, for permission, they didn't make me grovel too much. They were like, did you do what was right for the patient? Okay, yeah. so you didn't follow protocols. You did what was right for the patient. Um, cool. As long as you document it that way and make us, and, and we can tell from what you wrote, what your decision-making process was, we're okay with it. So. Do you know David Lacombe when he was up with the Gadian? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, David has an interesting background. He wandered into the school that I was the EMS director for. Mm -hmm. He had been in this, the personal protection business in Connecticut. Really? And decided he needed to do something different. <laughs> and uh, come waltzing into the training center down in Hollywood, Florida. And we put him through the paces to make him an EMT and then a paramedic. And he's done right well. He went from there to Broward County EMS. And then from Broward County EMS, he ended up running um, the rather fancy skills lab down at the University of Miami Medical College. Mm -hmm. And from there, jumped up to Acadian. Yeah. And now he's doing whatever he's doing with, is it Lerdal? No, not Lerdal. I'm not, I'm, sure I'm, I'm not sure where. I, I, but, forget uh, who, I forget who the parent company of that project is, but they are focused on improved cardiac resuscitation. That is their singular focus. You uh, know that that's been the holy grail we've been we've been seeking for yeah. ever since I've been an EMT. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I started, uh, nationwide survival rate uh, for cardiac arrest was around five percent. Uh, I remember on a good I, day. <laughs> yeah, I remember when it got to 10%. Um, and I remember now we're hovering at what, 12%. Yep. Uh, and one of the things that, that really sold me, and, and I was, at the time I went to work for Acadia, and I had been working for another large uh, ambulance uh, company that uh, was a little less, um, a little more regressive in, in their protocols. And, and I was doing things like, uh, I wanted to do things like, uh, resuscitate on scene and call terminate resuscitation efforts in the field. And they were just adamantly against that. And mm -hmm. uh, when I went to work at Acadian, they, uh, they were already doing that. And they said, yeah. look, um, in five years between 2005 and 2010, we tripled our cardiac arrest survival rate. Uh, we went from 7% to 23%. Um, and on some days we hover in the thirties and for a, for a, a service that has, uh, uh, as much a rural and suburban coverage area as Acadian does, uh, that's, that's not, that's, that's, that's not a hell of a batting average. average. Yeah. And, and the, and they'll tell you, you know, what do we do differently? We did less. We did less. We stopped taking the patient to the hospital and, and working a futile code thinking that, that somehow the, the magic, uh, ACLS ferry is going to do something in the ER that we couldn't do in a living room. Uh, and we quit intubating people early on. We quit making it. We, we gave our paramedics the, the freedom to decide whether it was necessary or not, but we quit harping on them if they didn't. And those two measures tripled our cardiac arrest survival rate. And it's hard to argue with, with things like that. And, and they've been generally pretty progressive as, as it goes along. Yeah. When you take a look at the physio respiratory physiology of intubating somebody and then ventilating the hell out of them, Yes. Um, it's rather shocking when you take a really hard look at it. Uh, and I think we're learning some of that with COVID, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just, um, go ahead. I, I just put a, I, I just um, uh, submitted an, an article to uh, Jim's airway site, uh, Journal of EMS uh, um, airway site uh, called uh, Preventing the Post Intubation Crash talking about uh, um, the dangers of peri-intubation hypoxia, uh, patients with a high shock index, patients who are potentially acidotic, uh, and that uh, those are major risk factors for, for uh, hemodynamic instability, even if it's an easy tube and you didn't waste any time. Uh, and, and, and Dr. Jarvis has been preaching this around the country and to his medics in Richardson County, Texas, resuscitate then intubate. Uh, I, th I think you got that from Scott Weingart, but it's great advice. And that's one of the things that, that we've been doing as well. And 
you know, it, it, it occurs to me now at this point in, in my EMS career, uh, it took me probably 20 years to learn one of the most important skills that a paramedic can have, and that's restraint. And I'm not talking about tying people down. I'm talking about the, the ability to do nothing. Uh, um, tincture of time and benign neg neglect and a little bit of fluorescent light therapy and watch and wait is actually uh, a, a really good uh, course of patient care in many, many situations. And, and the most important things are the things that we don't do. And cool. uh, it took me a while to learn that, but yep. intubation is one of those things. Yeah. You know, I'm, yeah. I say, and I'm running off at the mouth. I understand. I know, but oh, that's, okay. that's why we have here, man. <laughs> I tell people, I tell people I am, I am more proficient at airway management and a more skilled person with a laryngoscope than I have ever been in my career. And I was cocky. I still tell you, I can fall down a flight of stairs and accidentally intubate five people on the way down. Um, but at the same time, I am at the most skilled in my career. I'm also the least likely to intubate someone yeah yep. and, and and that is a skill that a tool that needs to remain in the box a lot more than it traditionally is I agree. Um, and and learning restraint was something that, that took me a long long time and and i'm still struggling with it <laughs> well you know um uh, way back when um uh, i used to listen to paramedics talking about the number of people they had intubated it was sort of like notches on their pistol yeah grips um and i used to think eh, you know maybe you could have bagged that patient and not had to intubate him at all yeah uh, maybe you would have done a hell of a lot less damage to the patient had you not intubated them yeah brian brian bledsoe and i were were uh sauntering around in the exhibit hall in the EMS conference one time. And one of the major flight services was there. And the, med the, the one of the flight medics was doing his recruiting spiel, uh, you know, uh, promising eager young medics who want to fly uh, the, the Holy Grail. You're going to work on the sickest patients um, and, and, and really trumpeting the patient acuity levels that they had to deal with and, and the clinical excellence that was expected. And he told this, this starry eyed paramedic, uh, you know, I did six surgical crikes in the last year and we just nodded. Cool. Huh. And Brian and I walked off and he just kind of side eyed me and he said, you know how many cr surgical crikes I've done in my career? <laughs> Less than six. <laughs> and I've been doing this for 30 years. I was a flight medic. I was a flight medical director. I've been an ER doc for, and he said, said, perhaps if you, if you've intubated or if you've cracked six people in the last year, perhaps something is lacking in your other skills. Wow. That's, <laughs> Assessment that's at the very stunning least. Stunning number. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you get a chance um, after we're done, take a look at some of the work that's been done by James Ducanto. Oh yeah. I, I, I oh, love you know Jim, technique then. and yeah. uh, uh and yeah, I, I make a, I incorporate that into uh, all my EMS, uh, my airway continuing education stuff. It's well, I'm also a very big having the bag, the better. Yeah, I'm a very big fan of the oscillator. Uh, yeah, because I can maintain an apneic patient without intubating them by using the oscillator, uh, yeah. which is and giving them an FIO two of, of FIO two of one point zero if I want to. So anyway. You ought to take a look at look at some of his stuff on the oxalate. Yeah. You might find it interesting. Okay. Um, now let me ask you this: Where do you see something like the National EMS Museum fitting into our toolbox as educators? You know, a wise man once said, a man once much wiser than me once said, uh, "You you can't see where you're going if you don't know where you've been." You know, and, and when, when you were talking, when you and I were chatting it up earlier and you talk about, you know, you, you can see the sunset of your career and, and when it's time to retire. And, and uh, my fiance was, was standing behind me frantically mouthing, no, 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 we can't, we can't lose the knowledge capital that, that our, our elder statesmen carry. Uh, that is something precious to, to the development of our profession. Yeah. We need the young bucks and, 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 uh, the future of EMS is not me and it's not you, but, uh, you know, you still need that wise village elder to, to, uh, to temper some enthusiasm and, and, uh, to share some wisdom. I think that, that 
maybe it's because the closer you and I get to becoming museum artifacts ourselves, the more important we think a museum is. But but I've been, you know, I, I was uh, when when Lou Jordan and and uh, the rest of the gang thought up the you know the 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 impetus of the the EMS museum. Um, I was I was one hundred percent on board because. You, you, we're we're two three generations past uh the the set of emts that were inspired by johnny and roy yeah. you know but uh and now what what passes for ems uh ems in hollywood is is something that i don't recognize and it doesn't have much to do with real life at all um and i'm maybe i'm a little fonder of of johnny and roy but uh knowing where we have come and, and there's nothing like perspective uh, to, to let you see things in a broader context. When I, I tell people, when they talk about advocacy, you know, and, and, and uh, the, the, the things that I, um, the things that I talk about so often and so passionately is, is things that most young paramedics uh, don't care about. And and uh, they said, we just need to get some of these youngsters fired up and, and, and on our side and, and, you know, show them the, the value of what it is we're trying to do. And I said, dude, you were a young paramedic at one time. You know, when you were a young paramedic, what was your focus? You're working your tail off. You're trying to, to, to raise a family, start a family and, and pay your mortgage and all that. When it is hard to turn your focus outward to where to, to your place in the profession when you're worried about your next paycheck, your next patient, uh, your next dialysis run, your next ACLS certification, and that's as far forward as you can think. Said so, so let's not get down on the new paramedics and the young paramedics for not having the same focus we do. What we ought to do is we ought to, to devote our energy toward um, making the profession better so that those guys can climb up that ladder of Maslow's hierarchy and they're not working on basic needs 10 years into their career. And that's the biggest favor we can do for them uh, yeah. as, as I don't know, elder statesman. I'm not an elder statesman. I'll fight that tooth and nail. Um, I don't have enough gray hair yet to be an elder statesman. What do you um, mean gray hair? Mine is gray. <laughs> I have white hair. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm getting some. It's all on my back, though. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, but, uh, it's, in your, it's in your beard, too. Kelly. Yes, it is. It's a, there's a lot more salt than, than pepper these days. Uh, but, you know, things like the museum, um, you know, the, the, uh, the Justice Department or law enforcement has their museums, the Texas Ranger Museum. Yep. You know, there are fire museums here. And I'm sure it, in Emmitsburg, there's, I can't remember where the, the major fire museum is, but every major service has has those artifacts out there. Well, the National Fire Hall and Firefighter Museum Memorial yeah. is up in Emmitsburg too. That's right. Yeah. Um, and the only, uh, you know, the the only museum we've had for years is is our our traveling exhibit. And I hope that we one day uh, one day in the foreseeable future, before my registry card expires for the last time that I can walk through there and, and look at some of the history that has been made in EMS and maybe, you know, look at an old uniform of mine or an old, uh, or an old uh, reusable BVM that you might've used back in the day. Um, I just think it's, it's way cool. Yeah. With, with Lou a few years back uh, when, when Lou was still alive, we, somebody handed us uh, one exhibit that I thought was one of the coolest things ever. It was the Life Pack 33. So named because it weighed only 33 pounds. 33 pounds, right. And flip it around, and the serial number played on the back was 00001. Wow. The very first life pack wow. portable defibrillator ever made. Wow. You know, who, what kind of EMS geek wouldn't just, just, just drool oh, yeah. over something yeah. like that? Yeah. And then you'd try and explain to these kids, yeah, we used to carry that. Yeah. I didn't have that one, but I had the MRL, but we carried that and a drug box and an oxygen backpack up two or three flights of stairs. And uh, a Plano 747 with the extra uh, storage go. underneath that you weighed betcha. 50 pounds all by itself. Yeah. You betcha. There are 
There were frequently calls on upper levels where when I got to the patient, I wondered who was going to need treatment first, me or the patient. Um, but anyhow, I, I had a patient once who uh, we called her tube me Sheila and Sheila would, would uh, she, she had a number of respiratory issues, asthmatic and COPD or, but she would get so um, decompensated that she would call EMS uh, and she could, she could heave out about two words at a time, tube me, tube me. So we, the first time I encountered her, my partner had met, had met her before and he knew what was coming. He said, you better get your scope out. And I said, what? So third floor of this apartment complex. And we had to, we had to go up the, the stairs, uh, couldn't, couldn't get our, uh, the elevator access to open. And when we got there, she could get out two words, tube me, tube me. We got her on the stretcher and she laid her hands on the rails, grasped the rails, opened her mouth and tilted her head back. And I just, okay, this is bizarre, but it got even more bizarre. I tubed her. She took this tube without fighting. We gently bagged her on down the hall. As we got down the hall to the head of the stairs, the elevator door dings open. And I think, oh, thank you, Jesus. My prayers are answered. So we shoehorn her, me and my partner, and all the gear we lugged up there inside the the uh, um, inside the elevator. Push the 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 first floor button. And while I'm trying to fiddle all this stuff and not drop anything and bag her at the same time, she reached up and took the bag from me and started squeezing it herself. <laughs> and I just went. <laughs> This is a practical joke. What, what, what is going on here? And got her to the hospital and, and the ER doc and the respiratory therapist was like, Hey, Sheila, what you do? What's going on right now? Ah, I see you're back again. You know, respiratory therapist said, dude, I could probably tell you her blood gas is what they'll be right now from heart. <laughs> so, what a hoot. Yeah. What a hoot. So um, you mentioned something near and dear to both Christy and I, which is, a permanent home for the museum sometimes yes. give you an idea of what kind of situation we're in right now we still have some stuff in shell knob missouri we have stuff in my storage facility down here christy has stuff up where she is um i'm not sure where else we have stuff oh no i've also got all of the document collection that richard narad had in california that's now down in the florida one warehouse about 16 miles from here so, I mean, we've got stuff spread all over the place and our greatest desire is to have a permanent home for everything. Now, the big question in our mind, and the lady is back, yeah. is do we get a building or do we get a big mobile museum that we can move around from conference to conference? I'm not sure what the best answer is, but it's gonna take money. And yeah. I think what a lot of folks don't realize is we get no federal funding. We get no state funding. Yeah. Everything that we are doing anything with is based upon voluntary contributions, mostly from within our community. Yeah, this um, is well and truly a labor of love for you guys. Oh, you bet. Um, and, and I don't know what else we can do to encourage our colleagues to pony up a little more money to help us do more of what it is we're trying to do. We've made huge strides in the last five or six years yeah uh, but we have a long long way to go and a lot of yeah. what we have done successfully is thanks to the lady at the bottom of the screen here christy van hover who's our director mm -hmm. uh, the smartest thing i did as president was snag this gal and bring her on board Good. she has gotten our act together and with that I will see if I get a word from our sponsor because all she's doing is sitting there smiling at me now. Uh, Christy, do you want to add anything? I love just sitting here and listening. Uh, the stories are great. And yes, I think that was uh, both for both of you, a very good pitch about the medium. And um, in fact, to give everybody that's listening a, a taste, the mobile museum we're looking to build, hoping to build, is about a $3 million project to keep it on the road for a year. Um, and so that's some serious dollars. If anybody out there listening um, 
has deep pockets, give me a call, <laughs> but let's work together as a community and see if we can't get some serious cash coming so that we yeah. can get traveling exhibits on the road 365 days a year. So we don't have to wait for the special conferences to come out. Um, we can go state to state to state and just keep the museum on the road every day. Probably not all day. They'd probably want to sleep as they're <laughs> moving the truck around. But um, yeah, we're looking at multi-million dollar projects now. Uh, we're serious about this museum thing. So in order to make that happen, we need everybody's help. We need everybody on board, sharing the word, asking friends, family, colleagues, bosses, companies to um, contribute to the museum cause and Really, Kelly and Nancy, if she's still sitting back there, really said it best. We can't let the knowledge go away. Um, we need to preserve it for future generations. And uh, we are really, really striving to be the go-to place uh, to tell the EMS story. 300 years of pre-hospital care is some of the coolest stories I have ever heard. And I'm not EMS, I am, I'm the museum gal. And I just love the stories that I'm getting to hear through coffee, through talking with service founders and uh, early paramedics. It's it's inspiring. Maybe my second career will be rural EMS. Who knows? We'll, we'll see how <laughs> the years play out. But um, yes, we, uh, we need millions. We're now talking millions of dollars. We're not joking anymore. So let's get those okay. millions there, of dollars there are rolling in. Hundreds of thousands of EMTs. I, I, you know, I think we probably... Surely we could all kick in a dollar or two or 20 or 30 uh, and, and ah, no hill for a stepper. We should be able to reach that goal if we all, if we all work towards it. Well, they don't have to Absolutely. kick in. A, they, they don't have to kick in a lot of money. They get, and if they kick in any money, then become a member, they get a mm -hmm. challenge coin. And then we have a new magazine that will be emerging shortly called EMS historian. Wow. And members will get a copy of EMS Historian. Um, we have uh, our first proof in, so there you go. There's the proof. I'm uh, not, not going to share any more than that, but we are designed and going to print <laughs> once we get through all the red marks that Christy put on the... To, I yep. can't wait to read it. It's, it's like, yeah. gather around the fire, children, and let Uncle Andrew <laughs> tell you about what it was like to reuse your bbms and what the oscillator was and the build a board and, yeah. and the jaw screw and the choke saver yeah. you joke about it but i have a three-year-old nephew that calls me to tell me all about the ambulance stuff he's learned throughout the week so we have long conversations about fire trucks and ambulances very cool awesome very cool. So I, we are I, here I'll, for the uh, generations i'll i'll hit you with a piece of trivia do you know who, who designed that logo for the EMS National EMS Museum? I do, I do. Who? Yours truly, <laughs> sitting right here. Kelly, you do? Yeah. Well, you Lou and I were, we were, we were looking for um, uh, a, a museum logo and, and something that would, would work well on a challenge coin. And I said, uh, I said, how about ambulances throughout the years? parked in, in formation, start off with a horse-drawn carriage and then a high-top Cadillac hearse and then a, 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 a modern Type 3 and maybe throw in a, an EMS helicopter there and, and EMS through the years. And uh, Lou Jordan turned that, turned that over to his graphics, uh, graphic arts department at uh, um, emsbooks.com. EMS and books, yep. and uh, they made it happen. Uh, they, yep. they brought the what was a very ugly, rough sketch by me. I was, you know, I was actually talented at art when I was a kid. And that <laughs> part of me is utterly dormant now, but um, uh, they made it look and man, it's, if, if we can have a, uh, if we can have a, a home worthy of, of that awesome logo, uh, that, that'll be a, that'll be a success worth, worth boasting about. It would be something. Um, you know, how I got sucked into this thing. How, how's that? I got a phone call from Lou one day. I want you on this board. What board, Lou? <laughs> <laughs> and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That See, that's... You talk about knowledge, Kaplan. I'm going to get sentimental and maudlin for a little bit. But, but um, not 
everybody. And this, this is something I'll forever be thankful for in my career is to have met guys like you guys like Bledsoe and been mentored by, by guys like Bledsoe and, and Lou Jordan over the years, Lou Jordan per, published the first version of my book. Uh, when I was in a very dark place, I tried to write as, as some kind of catharsis and uh, I got eight or 10 stories written and uh, my partner loved it. She said, you should, you should get this published. So I trusted Lou to give me the straight dope. Yep. And I sent those to Lou and two days later, he was like, all right, I'm going to publish this. You let me know when it's done. I'm going to publish this. And maybe it sells a million copies. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it sells just a few and gets you noticed by a bigger publisher. Uh, and, and you can go on to bigger and better things, but we're going to get you rolling. And, and it was Lou Jordan and Brian Bledsoe uh, that, that encouraged me to, to step out beyond my ambulance and think about more than my next paramedic call yeah. and, my next, uh, and, and my next paycheck. And I'll forever be thankful for that. Yeah. And these, these youngsters, they don't, they will never have the, the opportunity to walk through an EMS conference exhibit hall with the Doc Clinchies and the Lou Jordans where you can't walk more than 10 feet before you're meeting some luminary of EMS that you have read their stuff, watched their TV shows, starry eyed fascination. And, and they just introduce you. It's like, you know, and it was like learning the secret handshake because, because Lou Jordan introduced you or because Doc Clinchy uh, threw his arm around his shoulder and said, this guy's going to go places. Uh, you're a part of the club. And, and that was the awesome thing, you know, Hey, do you, do you know what the points of the star of life mean? They didn't teach you that in school. Well, here's the guy that came up with the star of life and, yeah. and look over here, here's Joe. He's got the original recipe for blood and <laughs> this kind of stuff. <laughs> and you guys knew everybody. And, and, uh, that was a heck of an entree into, uh, into a profession that I've devoted my life to. And I just, uh, I'm, I'll forever be thankful for it. Cool. Yeah. Kelly, thanks for the time. Absolutely. It has been it has been my pleasure. Now been I'm fun, gonna go buddy. eat brownies and uh and been uh, fun. a beverage of my choice. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Absolutely. It is time everywhere for a beverage of choice. So uh, have a couple of those beverages at emsmuseum.org backslash donate. Be sure to get your donations in uh, by the end of the year and you get a 2021 tax receipt. So that's always uh, a good one. And uh, we'll catch you uh, hopefully in November. I can't remember what date we have down, but uh, we'll post it on Facebook. We'll send it out. And um, thank you all very much. Have a safe, happy Halloween. And uh, we'll catch you in November. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks for the time, buddy. Good to Thanks, see you. Doc.